How y'all doing? This book review I want to do is, um, is Mark P. Winton's Pterosaurs. Okay, now I may imagine the name, but if you skip that aside and you, understand, you look through all the context of this, I guarantee it's a well-worthy read for not just Paleobus, but for anyone interested in pterosaurs in general, which I think you should be after, you know, just um, looking at this you know, and finding out the diversity. Because let's face it, to the average layperson, when they learn about dinosaurs in grade school, okay, they may have heard of, you know, Pterodactyl or Pteranodon, and that's probably the most, and maybe Ramphorhynchus, if, you know, but even then, uh, most paleobus would um, probably know more species. But the average person, probably just those two names, and most people get them switched, and or just call any flying dinosaur, which is incorrect, a pterodactyl. Even pteranodon, which is a larger species with a horn on its side. And I've seen this happen too many times. So, if you wish to cure yourself of that type of ignorance, again, pick up a copy of this. This is um, Mark B. Winton's Pterosaurs, um, published by Princeton back in 2013, so the information is fairly up to date. It's only about three years old by the time of this video. And um, Mark P. Winton is a, not only a paleontologist who studies specifically in pterosaurs, he's also a paleo artist. And all the artwork in this is done by him. All the paintings and all that are beautifully illustrated, showing these animals not as monsters as you usually see them as pop culture. I mean, I have a copy of King Kong of 1933, where when King Kong battles a pteranodon, uh, they, they give it bat-like wings, which is, which you should see, if you ever saw, uh, um, you know, the wings of a bat, it's just basically, besides from the phone, these three kind of stretch out, and with them um, webbing, the lepatogeum you know, is in between the fingers and all that, and that's what has its, that's its arm. Pterosaurs is different. If you take your arm, um, you have, this finger is reduced to nothing. These three kind of stick out. You have a modified, sort, sort of a modified wrist bone here called a pteroid, which produces a small wing-like flap above the arm called a propatogeum. And you take this one, which is your ring finger, and extend that out. And that's when, that's where the uh, brachiopatogeum, which is the main wing down here, you know, from the arm, from that wing down to the lower body there on the side. That's how pterosaur wing structures are. And this book is fascinating because the first few chapters, um, the first nine chapters, he talks about the history, he talks about the bone structure, talks about the possibilities of where the pterosaurs came from. Generally, there are, um, you know, many paleontologists say that there's sort of a group of arc archosaurs, which are these uh, reptile-like creatures from diapsids. And it's from there that you, um, but even then, he talks about there's some debate about that. He goes around to the bone structure about um, how each um, pieces of uh, general pterosaur anatomy is. It's probably good to study that very well before you get into it, but he's very good at explaining all this. He even talks about the soft bits. Oh, here's an interesting technique about how we knew about the um, soft bit structure. That is using ultraviolet light um, on many of the fossils. See, the thing is, um, most pterosaurs, we see them in a lot of thin slabs um, of rock, but if you put ultraviolet light, you get to see the carbon fiber remains of uh, some of the wings, the in interior of the wings, the supporting structures and all that, telling us a lot more about uh, um, about the animals. So he talks about, um, he even talks about the bit about flying, um, how they could have flied, and why there's, um, how good they could have flying based on the structures and everything. And then, from starting from chapter 10, he talks about the families of different um, of pterosaurs, from the most primitive, you know, you know, like Ramphorhynchus and all that, to the Ars Darkids, which are probably the largest pterosaurs we found, where, you know, standing up there about as tall as giraffes in the last frame of the slideshow, you get to see that's the author with a full-scale model of his Ars Darkid. You know, it's wonderful. And one of the most interesting pterosaurs I um, found fascinating, it belongs to the family camp of Campy Longnathoidids, and particularly the species Cavaramus. You know, this guy right here. What I found so interesting about this guy and um, similar ones in this group is that the teeth, this is not a very good one right here, but as you go through this, most pterosaur teeth, if it have any at all, are just these one single little sharp teeth that you, you know, um, little slender carnivorous type teeth. Nothing really special, right? But this one has teeth that are multi-cusp, meaning like in one tooth, you got like multiple uh, points on there. I find that very you know interesting about it because yeah, that's unique um, within uh, flying reptiles, at least what we generally know about this. Um, well, but then again, you know, you, if they have teeth, some of them have, will have teeth. Um, they have you know unique ones, like say um, was a pterodostrus, 
which is a relative of pterodactylus, um, which has so many thin modified teeth that it almost acts as bait. It serves as a similar purpose as baleen on whales. And, and okay, you may think, oh, so they developed their own baleen. Actually, no, these are actual teeth. They have dentin, they have enamel, they have the pulp still intact after analysis of them. So he goes into detail about what we know and what we don't know about them. And he even, you know, tells about um, how is it that um, you know, they can know, which is amazing when he keeps describing what little we have of pterosaurs in, in total. Um, when it comes to lightly built animals or very small animals, it's very hard to get them preserved, you know, because they have such very um, delicate bone structures, they're easily scavenged away. So it's amazing we have what we have. But uh, with paleontology, it's a matter of diligence and, you know, as well as serendipity. They have to keep going out there, keep finding fossils, and every time they find one, they can bring it back, and after extensive study, we get more information about it. But in this book, he not only tells you what they know, he also tells you where scientists conflict themselves, so you get an idea about the debate part in science, where, um, okay, yes, um, okay, what do you think that pterosaurs would eat? If you probably think fish, like you see birds, they go over the ocean, they dip their beaks in there, and they grab a fish and eat it. Um, many people would think that, but he tells, uh, but Witten tells how him and other scientists, like, this is not really the case. Studying the bone structure and how their necks bend and all that, and how their, um, their beaks and their jaws, they're not quite um, equipped to do that type of stresses. Um, like, you know, even just fishing in the water by diving and all that. Um, and also another thing that um, some of us bail us with herds, like, why do um, pterosaurs have hollow bones? And the most intuitive part, most common answer is, well, this makes them lighter. Well, not really, because it, the bone mass is still the same. When he talks about the mass of the bones is still the same in comparison to similar sized animals. He talks about when a bone is modified um, with these air sacs, these air pockets, there, it doesn't remove the bone entirely, it just takes the bone and replaces it somewhere else. It stretches it to a um, maximum limit that you can with that mass. And that's why in some bone walls it's about a millimeter thick, you know, so a very, a very light weight. But he even talks about how some of the intuitive parts we hear about, even studying a little bit about pterosaurs, is kind of wrong and he explains why. Um, one part, one chapter I found interesting is um, certain things we find in pterosaurs you don't think about, like parasites. Yes, that's very fascinating as well. Now, what's another part I'm trying to think of? Oh, oh, like, well, one of the things I also found that was neat, because pterodactyl, pterodactyl is the most famous of pterosaurs, um, one of the earliest we found. Most of what we find of that, um, um, like, you look at the skull, it just looks like it has a very sloped back skull, no head crest, but thanks to further evidence and with, um, with certain um, observation techniques, I guess, I think it was because of like um, the um, ultraviolet light, we now know it does have a crust. So the image of that is changing. So that puts all the old fashioned pictures out of date. But that's how science goes. So um, let's, I'm still trying to think about that one thing. We're talking about the, um, you, know, the you know, how the pterosaurs eat, um, vision parts kind of, it's not exactly true, or um, even the, um, the hollow bones, you know, again. But there's one more part, I can't remember it, and I wish I could. But again, if you read the book, you probably would, you'll eventually read it anyway. So yes, I definitely recommend Mark P. Winston's book, Pterosaurs, pick this out, read it. If just, not just if you're a paleo buff, but even if you're just a regular lay person. He explains it to you. If you're a real person that has a hard time with anatomy, don't worry, earlier chapters, if you study them, you will and know the terminologies. He's very good at explaining them. And you can reference back when he talks further into the families and all that. And you get to understand the wide diversity uh, of what this group is. And as most people have, doesn't even realize that what's out there. So, yes, definitely check this book out. Thank you very much. Y'all have a nice day.